If you're in the market at the moment for a modern classic motorcycle that really has that retro charm, then Moto Guzzi's V7 850 Special has got to be somewhere in your shortlist. I mean, this is one stylish looking bike. And whilst obviously wearing this adventure helmet, I look like a total twit, uh, normally I feel really stylish too when I'm riding this bike. Anyway, welcome to CG Rides. And uh, the sun's out and the rain has stopped and the roads are dry. So I thought it's time to come out and do a proper review of this bike. I've had it for two years, almost exactly. And I've done just over 2000 miles on it. Now I'll admit that's not a huge amount of mileage, but it's a little bit deceptive because I've mostly used this bike for shorter trips. So I, I do feel like I've ridden it enough to be able to share my opinion with you. In fact, this bike is the whole reason why I started a second YouTube channel for motorcycling. Uh, my main channel is all about tech, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, look up constant geekery. Uh, but you're not here for that, you're here to learn about this bike. And I did have some challenges when I first bought this, because my uh, first impressions review unfortunately was slightly spoiled because uh, the bike had a check engine light on straight away. And I'm not gonna go into loads of detail on that in this video. Uh, two years has passed, it's been sorted out. It was just a mapping issue to do with uh, Euro 5. And by all accounts, uh, that's become rather common these days. Uh, but at the time, it wasn't a common thing. It was quite disturbing to me to uh, have the light come on within 30 miles from picking it up, brand new. And uh, it spoiled my enjoyment of it because it took a long time to get sorted. So that took the shine off the first year of riding and last year I didn't get to ride it as much as I wanted to, uh, mainly because I ended up buying a touring bike so that my wife and I could uh, do trips together. Again, I've completely digressed. Let's talk about this bike. First of all, let's cut to the chase. I love this bike. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, but let me tell you why, and I will tell you the couple of things that I don't like about it so much. But I thought what I'd do for this review is I'll start at the front of the bike and kind of work backwards. So uh, go to the very front, <laughs> the front wheel, which has a single brake disc on it. Now, that might put some people off because you think, well, will it brake effectively? Well, there's nothing behind me, so I'm going to hit the anchors. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the initial sort of bite isn't quite there. I mean, if you're expecting a sports bike, it's not. But once you've uh, grabbed on the lever, it's going to pull up pretty sharp. Uh, it's enough for this type of bike. So it uh, has never bothered me. I've always been able to stop nice and smartly. And uh, I think it's a good brake. Whilst we're talking about brakes, I suppose I should do the back brake, even though I said I'd go front to back, but the back brake is really nice. Uh, I'm a keen back brake user. I like to stabilize myself uh, through the middle of a corner with a dab of brake sometimes. And obviously in slow moving traffic, uh, it's a really good brake. Uh, will it stop the bike? Uh, that's, yeah, no. You know, it's a back brake at the end of the day. It's not very aggressive, uh, but I found it absolutely fine for my riding style. So brakes are, are good enough. Would I like a, a second disc on the front? Uh, probably would actually for when uh, you are getting on at a lick. But I think for most people in the target demographic for this bike, uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. The wheels themselves are spoked and they're not the type where you can uh, get away without having an inner tube. Uh, you do need an inner tube with these tyres. Uh, that's actually worked in my favour already because I've got a puncture on the back wheel and uh, it was just a case of replacing the inner tube. I did try repairing it but it, it just wasn't holding so uh, yeah new inner tube is a lot cheaper than a new tyre. Uh, so I personally don't mind it. I've never noticed any issues with handling. I think the tyres on this are really good. I've never had an instance where I've felt a little bit insecure, like I'm slipping around. So uh, thumbs up there. Let's get to the uh, front of the bike now. With the V7 Special, you get a round headlight. Traditional headlight with a chrome rig. I haven't done a lot of nighttime riding, so I'm probably not best placed to offer an opinion on that, but uh, I've found it to be okay. The indicators have a kind of modern look to them, but I don't think they spoil the retro style of the bike at all. And they're nice and bright. The other thing you get with the 850 Special as opposed to the standard V7 is the twin retro clocks, which I much prefer because the standard V7 has this kind of single clock that's more digital and off-center as well. It's not in the 
center of the handlebar and I think that looks a little bit odd. I much prefer the look of these clocks with their chrome rings and analog dials for speed and uh, a tachometer as well. And I've uh, rather annoyingly placed my uh, rear-facing camera right in front of the uh, digital display, but I did want to take you through that. Now, if you can see down here on the, the right-hand bar, I've got a mode button. Uh, that's not riding modes. That uh, is used to change the mode of display on the uh, digital readout there. So first of all, it's in the odometer at the moment. And when you have it in that mode, all you see is your total mileage. Let's press the mode button. Uh, now we're into our trip meter, which tells us uh, how many miles we've done since we reset it. And you'll also notice there in the top left, a gear indicator, which is a really nice thing to have. As you can see, I'm in sixth gear at the moment, just pootling along, plenty of torque. Very nice, talk about that in a minute. Uh, now this doesn't use a gear position sensor. It's actually doing a calculation based on the engine speed and the road speed to figure out which gear you're in. And that's mostly okay once you're rolling, but uh, what you'll notice is, uh, sort of changing down the gears there. So I'm in fourth. If I just pull the clutch in, it doesn't know what gear I'm in anymore. Let the clutch out. There we go, it's recalculated. I'm in fourth gear. It's incredibly reliable. Uh, but if you're used to, say, a BMW that uh, always knows what gear you're in, then you might find that a little bit odd. Uh, works fine, though. Uh, the next one is time, and that is not the time of day. That is the time you've been riding since you reset the clock. Uh, the next one is our average miles per hour. Then we have average fuel MPG. So you can see since I reset it, I've been averaging 62.4 miles per gallon. Uh, now that's UK gallons, which are larger than uh, American gallons, just so you're aware of that. Uh, I can't remember what the difference is. I'll do a conversion on screen to give you the miles per gallon in US. And uh, if I'm feeling up to it, I'll calculate the metric as well. Is it liters per hundred kilometers? The bike is really frugal, as you would expect from a mid-size V-twin. So you're not going to be making loads of trips to the fuel station. There is no fuel gauge, incidentally, so you do need to do the reset the trip meter thing. And uh, I've got to be honest, I've never really paid any attention to it. So I mean, this is a bit of useless information, really, because I can't tell you how far you can go on an individual tank. Um, certainly well over 100 miles. And when the light comes on, I, I've gone as far as 30 miles before actually putting fuel in it. But obviously that will depend on how hard you're riding. But generally it's just not an issue, fuel in the tank. It's, uh, and not having a fuel gauge doesn't bother me at all. It's the way it used to be with older bikes, so uh, that's fine. And in any case, I've always found the uh, fuel gauges on motorcycles to be totally unreliable. They just tell you that the tank is full and then drop like a, a stone afterwards. Anyway, let's move on, press the mode button again. Uh, we've got our instant fuel consumption, which obviously will jump around a bit. Then we have the temperature outside. Uh, I've got it in degrees Celsius. I assume it's possible to put it in Fahrenheit as well. And if we press the mode button again, now we get a clock and that is indeed time of day. And uh, I can't work out if that's correct or not the clocks have just changed today in the UK. It's the 31st of March when I'm recording this video. Another press of the mode button and you can see we're now in something called MGCT. Now this is the traction control. So the bike does have uh, ABS and traction control and I'm not convinced a bike with uh, this kind of power needs traction control. It will kick in when you go over bumps and things like that. So I have felt it, but uh, I've never slipped the bike or felt it kicking in because the bike is sliding. But hey, it's a nice thing to have. And you can adjust the level of the traction control. I believe there are three levels. I've never messed with it. So um, yeah. And when we press mode again, we're back to the odometer. So that's pretty easy. The rest of the switch gear on the right, you've got your emergency engine cut off and you've got your starter button as well. Uh, move to the switch gear on the left. We've got our high beam flasher here, our high beam selector indicators and horn. It's the usual sort of stuff. There's nothing special. Uh, there's no heated grips. I don't know if there is a factory option for heated grips. I wish I had heated grips because you are totally exposed with it being a naked bike. So they would make a difference. So I recommend popping some of those on. 
uh, but you can get those aftermarket Oxford ones for, for not much. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to those if you want to support the channel. Yeah, so what else can we say about the front of the bike? The clocks are nice, they don't, uh, the needles don't wobble around, it's easy to read at night time. You've got your ignition key there at the front and we've got a proper handlebar. Uh, and as you can see, I've got my uh, rear-facing GoPro clamped on with this nice small rig clamp. And I've got my GoPro remote control here over the, uh, the middle of the handlebar. That's obviously not a standard thing. Uh, let's move on to the mirrors. Uh, I am six foot one or about uh, 185 centimeters and I find the mirrors needed a bit of adjusting for me and they're probably at the kind of limit. I think taller riders might find you have to kind of duck down a bit sometimes to see what's going on behind you. But generally speaking, I think the, the mirrors are a nice shape. I think they fit the design of the bike and they're pretty good. They don't vibrate too much. You can see what's going on. So that's nice. I really like these uh, bar ends as well. Nice chrome bar ends. Really finishes the bike off nicely. Uh, we have a mechanical clutch, so a cable clutch, but it's nice and light and easy to use. And uh, over on the right side are Brembo brake lever by the look of it. I think the brakes are Brembo actually. I'll uh, confirm that when we do a walk around of the bike. So coming back from there we've got our fuel tank in this beautiful blue colour with the grey pinstripe. I think this looks really classy. I'm not as much of a fan of the current colours but uh, they, they all do look pretty good. This blue was absolutely my preference and when I walked in the shop it just uh, blew me away. It was uh, the only thing I saw. And I actually went to go and test ride a, a Royal Enfield Interceptor, which I did, lovely bike. Um, but after I'd seen this, I, I already knew when I was out on the Enfield that uh, the Gootsy was going to be uh, getting the nod, despite costing considerably more. So the fuel filler cap is this lovely Moto Gootsy branded key job, and uh, you turn the key and completely removes the, the fuel cap. Very traditional style. It's a nice shaped tank as well. You've got these kind of uh, space for your legs, which I think is really nice. I just love then to look down and see the uh, cylinders peeking out from the side. I'm gonna talk about the engine last, even though it is one of the most important things of a bike. Obviously, if you're looking for a bike like this, you are interested in the way it looks. You've got a, a usual steel cradle frame, obviously, and I think uh, Moto Guzzi have really pulled off a, a nice look to this bike. One of the best things about it is that it's an air-cooled engine, so there's no radiator gubbins on the front. It just looks really clean and stylish, and I like that. And I think the choice of this uh, brown material on the seat, it's not leather, but it uh, seems to be pretty hard wearing. It dries very quickly, which is nice, and it's very comfortable. It looks good, and it's nice to sit on. And generally speaking, the bike is a comfortable place to be. I think I can uh, easily flat foot the bike. I'll uh, I'll double check that when we stop. But uh, I feel comfortable when I'm riding it. Uh, I am a taller guy. I could probably appreciate uh, a little bit more leg route, but it's really not a big deal. And I have done a couple of longer trips on this bike and I've not felt uncomfortable at any point. So I just pulled over to uh, do a bit of B-roll. And I have to say, uh, I've ridden for a load of muck. So uh, the bike is filthy. Hopefully you can uh, forgive that. I just wanted to report on the flat footedness though. So me at uh, 6'1 or 185 centimeters, I'm comfortably flat footed on this bike. Very nice too. It's pretty good for pillions too. The only thing that you've got to watch is the chrome grab rail, which is a nice thing to hold on to, but uh, also as the bike is bouncing around, my wife reported that uh, it was sort of slapping the bottom of her her spine on her tailbone you know quite uncomfortable uh, so which means she has to scooch forward I'm not complaining but uh, yeah she was I like the look of the rear mug guard I think it fits the bike and I don't feel the need to put a tail tidy on or anything like that and I love the look of the exhaust pipes as well nice chrome pipes and the shape of them I just think it uh, accentuates the look of the bike they look really good I was tempted for a while to put some different pipes on slightly louder because I think the bike could benefit from that but these do sound nice uh, when you can hear them they're not obnoxiously loud or anything like that uh, what I found is with all of the replacement pipes they just don't quite keep that stylish look 
that uh, drew me to the bike in the first place, which is why I never did it. Uh, but there are some pretty stylish options out there that are very close to the originals and you don't have to get the bike remapped or anything for those. Uh, let's talk about suspension now. So uh, everything is uh, non-adjustable as far as I'm aware. Obviously you could adjust for preload, the usual kind of thing. Got uh, twin springs and shocks on the back and uh, the forks on the front, traditional right way up forks. I think it all works pretty well and I think the handling of the bike is actually really good. You can get on at a fair old lick on this bike and it's quite light, it's very agile, you know, you could easily throw it into corners, which is really nice. However, obviously there are limits. This is not a super premium bike. You haven't got Olins or active suspension or anything like that. And uh, British roads are pretty abysmal to say the least. So you will find the suspension kind of runs out of ideas if you're on a bumpy British B road and it uh, can bounce around a little bit and uh, that has caused me just to back off in the past of rides but when you get a nice uh, stretch of reasonable road there's no issues at all and in general riding I find it very comfortable and again going back to the pillion it's very comfortable too up and I didn't really notice much difference to the handling of the bike even and the brakes again absolutely fine so if uh, it is something that you're thinking about maybe getting and doing some longer trips on, you can get some very nice traditional looking saddlebags uh, to match the look and style of the bike and uh, take your significant other on the back and you'll have a great time. I guess there is a downside to older bikes like this and that is that you're completely exposed to the wind. And if you're on a motorway at 70 miles an hour, it's not the nicest place to be because you are getting buffeted around a lot. That said, for less than £200, you can get an aftermarket little windscreen that'll make all the difference. I have actually got one. I bought one and I've never fitted it to the bike and uh, it's still in its box. And for reasons that I'm not gonna go into in this video, um, that is never gonna get fitted to this bike. Uh, so if you're in the market for one of those and you're in the UK, drop me a line, I'll gladly sell it to you. It is as new. Uh, but uh, I'm sure we could come to an arrangement where you save yourself a bundle of pennies. I think the one I went for is a kind of smoked finish, which I thought would look really good with this bike. Just never got round to fitting it. I mentioned earlier that the clutch has a nice light feel to it. And the gearbox is nice and smooth too, with the exception of um, what it's cold. The first thing in the morning when you've started the bike, I tend to actually just uh, let it run for a couple of minutes, let it idle and warm up a bit. Uh, because it's uh, quite, um, what's the word, recalcitrant? That's far too big a word to be using on YouTube. It's a little bit um, resistant. It doesn't want to go from first to second. Uh, you actually have to kind of declutch and, and push it in when it's cold. But it does warm up relatively quickly. And once it's warm, I've not had any of those problems at all. Uh, some people say that it is quite an agricultural gearbox and I don't really agree with that. I think it's, uh, I'm changing gear, it's, it's nice and smooth. If you use the clutch, it's fine. And uh, when I get the opportunity to open the bike up, I will uh, demonstrate clutchless gear shifts as well, uh, because actually it, they're really good. I think it's a good gearbox. I've got no issues with it at all. So let's uh, talk about the engine. And it is the typical Moto Guzzi V-Twin mounted, uh, what's the correct term? Is it laterally or transverse or sideways? It's sideways in the frame. The cylinder heads stick out either side. And that means it's ideal, of course, for shaft drive, which is what this bike has. Now, if like me, you detest cleaning chains and oiling chains, then you're gonna like this bike. Shaft drive is a lovely thing. Where are we gonna go? Let's. Uh, Let's head left here. Yeah, it is very nice. I had the uh, V85 TT adventure bike before this, uh, hence the um, slightly ridiculous looking adventure helmet all kitted up with my cameras. And I had that for three years and I really enjoyed that bike, really enjoyed it. It's a great bike and having a shaft drive, yeah, that makes a difference to me. And it was one of the reasons why I decided to go for this bike over the Enfield. It, 
I've now swapped that uh, V85 TT for a BMW, a bit more comfortable for, for the wife on the back. Uh, that's actually an RT touring bike and it's very heavy and I've already dropped it, but that's the subject of another video. Now how does the uh, Moto Guzzi shaft drive compare to a BMW shaft drive? Uh, well I would say very similar. I don't really detect any difference, uh, they're both very smooth. If you were to compare it say with a VFR 1200, I know that's not a current bike but I had one of those and it had a V4 in the normal position and obviously then had a, some gearing for the shaft drive and it was always very sloppy and that could be pretty unpleasant at slow speeds but no such issues with the Moto Guzzi feels every bit as good as a BMW shaft drive and uh, they're nice and easy to maintain and that's the other benefit that comes from having an engine with cylinder heads sticking out the side it's easy to get to everything so your maintenance costs are cheap there's no ludicrously expensive valve checks to be done on this bike uh, it, they're easy to do because you haven't got to take the bike apart to get to the top of the cylinder when it comes to fuel consumption it's very frugal as you'd expect from a, a mid-sized twin uh, so the other cost is insurance and obviously this varies massively uh, depending on your experience and uh, where in the world you are so I can only tell you what I'm paying I, I paid £94 for the year to insure this in the UK uh, I'm in my mid-40s, I've got nine years no claims bonus, the bike is garaged and I live in uh, the countryside. So I don't know how useful that information is but uh, generally speaking I would say for most people the costs of running a bike like this are pretty reasonable and a lot lower than say an equivalent sports bike. So that's a nice thing. It's easy to maintain yourself as well. This is actually a really simple engine. The, the complicated thing on these bikes, as with all new bikes, trying to uh, comply with Euro 5 emission standards, uh, is the electronics. And maybe we'll just come back to that in a moment. But generally speaking, maintenance on the engine, very easy. If you're the kind of uh, person that likes to tinker yourself, it's gonna be really easy to service the bike yourself and look after it. Now, what's it like riding one of these engines so it's uh, around about 850 cc i'll put the exact number up on the screen and it's got a lot of character to it it sounds great as well it's got a, a dry clutch and uh, it's just got bags of character lovely sounding bike yeah kind of feel the rumble and that kind of lateral torque as it's uh, a sort of side to side feeling that doesn't affect your balance or anything like that it's uh it's just a really characterful engine that's nice to ride it sounds good and uh it pulls well now it is actually the same engine that is in the v85 tt but it doesn't really feel like the v85 tt it's got the same characteristics um, but it's not making anywhere near the same kind of power now I don't know why that is, I don't know if there is a component difference in the V85 engine or whether it's just a software map, but uh, this particular engine on this bike is making 65 horsepower, whereas the V85 TT is a shade under 80, so that is quite a difference. Now that said, brake horsepower is probably the most useless figure on a bike, unless you're looking to take a sports bike on a track. Uh, then you might be interested in brake horsepower. So torque is what really matters. And this bike has 70 newton meters of torque. And I'll do the imperial conversion and put that up on screen. And I think it makes that at around about 5,000 revs, but it, it does start pulling really well from around 3,000. Now the V85, that makes 100 newton meters. Now that is a big difference again. And it makes a huge difference when you're riding the bike. Now, obviously, the V85 is a heavier bike and uh, it needs that additional power to feel right as an adventure bike. And incidentally, if you're looking at one of those uh, ample power, I did lots of touring on mine with pillion, with full luggage, never felt like it wasn't powerful enough. So don't read too much into the power figures and make bike purchasing decisions based on that. The reason for bringing these things up is just really to help you understand the, the difference between the engines. So it might be the same engine, but it doesn't really behave the same way. Now, where you really notice this is uh, 
low down in the rev range. So let me just try and demonstrate this. I'm in fifth gear at fairly low RPM. If I crack open the throttle, it does get moving, but if you're in too high a gear at too low revs, it, it does bog down a little. And the V85 by comparison is very eager. When you open the throttle in pretty much any gear, it's got the torque and will shove you forward. Would I like to have a little bit more power and a little bit more torque on this bike? I think the answer to that is yes. Would it benefit from having the full amount of power that the V85 has? I think if you went down that road, you'd probably very quickly get to the point where the brakes really aren't up to the job and you start needing you start needing to upgrade other components, which then increases the cost of the bike. I think it's probably about right. Maybe could do it a little bit more. Maybe Moto Guzzi will do that in a future iteration. Although I'm slightly concerned that uh, with all the hassle they had getting this engine working with Euro 5, uh, when Euro 6 becomes a thing, I suspect air-cooled engines might be a thing of the past. Moto Guzzi are already going liquid-cooled with the V100. And isn't the new Stelvio got the same liquid-cooled engine? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there in the comments. Just uh, heading through the town of Yeovil here in Somerset. Very nice part of the world. I used to actually have an office here in Yeovil, I used to come here to work. I always liked the place. Uh, just up the road here we've got a dual carriageway, so when we get there I will open it up and we'll do those clutchless gear changes that we spoke about. And you'll be able to sort of get a sense of uh, how the bike performs. Overall though, I really like the engine. I think it's a good combination with this bike. It feels right. It feels like uh, it was meant to be together. I think if you're considering one of these bikes, you're going to enjoy it. It absolutely delivers on that kind of retro charm, easy motorcycling, uh, not feeling rushed in places you go. But if you want to open it up and have some fun, well, you can. So uh, let's have a go at that now. Yeah, no issues at all there, getting up to illegal speeds if you're so inclined. Sounds great. I don't know how well that will come out on the camera's microphone, but uh, there you go. And I was doing clutchless gear changes there, and uh, it was all nice and smooth. Changes gear nicely. It's a really nice bike to ride. What more can I say about it? If you're in the market for one of these bikes, I definitely recommend taking a test ride. Uh, I think it uh, offers more character and style than say for instance a, a triumph bonneville or a street twid as they call it now uh, i think it's more natural competitor is probably something like kawasaki's w800 uh, the triumphs definitely make more power a little bit more sporty but i don't think they've quite got the the style and the look that moto guzzi have achieved with this if you want that italian look then it's great now i did say i would talk about the electronics on the bike and one of the things that I found irritating through the whole process of having a check engine light on is there's no codes displayed for the user and even the dealers don't know what the codes mean. They have to contact uh, Moto Guzzi support and that takes time. It just means if anything goes wrong, your bike is stuck at a dealer for a bit of time. And Moto Guzzi are not the best at communicating. That said, they got the job done. They will sort you out and uh, they did also give me an extra year's warranty and an extra year breakdown cover for my trouble. Uh, they actually offered me a choice of a free service although the extra warranty and I, I took the latter. It did take a bit of effort to get that from them though. It took a bit of communicating with them. They didn't really seem to understand the problem. Uh, my situation was made a lot worse because my supplying dealer went bust and here in the UK, all of your consumer rights exist with the retailer, not the manufacturer. So in actual fact, Moto Guzzi didn't have to do anything for me uh, other than warranty work. And uh, they did look after me in the end. It just, it just took a bit of time and it was frustrating. Could have been better with some communication. So if you really want to follow that saga, then uh, there are videos about it. But what I want to say is don't let it put you off buying one of these bikes. Those issues have been resolved 
and any bike you buy will have the latest map on it. I've not had any issues at all since uh, Moto Guzzi applied that map over a year ago. Uh, the bike's been absolutely fine. And even when the check engine light was on, there wasn't any issue with the bike. It was running fine. It was uh, just the concern of having a light on devalues your brand new bike, doesn't it? Now this is me from the future. I just want to chip in at this point uh, in the edit. Just to say I've been testing the um, throttle response down at uh, low RPMs and I've got to say I'm not finding the, any issues at all. The bike does pull. It still doesn't pull like a... Oh, here we go, look. From low speed. It does get up and go. It's not quite the same as a V85 TT, it doesn't have that same eagerness, but it certainly isn't bogging down, which is what it did when it was new. And I think that's just kind of stayed in my memory. And I haven't, I've kind of been riding around it. I've been changing down gears. Uh, maybe I didn't need to. So I think this must have been corrected when they uh, put the new map on the bike, when they fixed the check engine light. So perhaps disregard what I said about that. I think the throttle response at low RPMs is actually fine for what it is. Yes, doesn't have the grunt of the V85 that has the same engine. Would like a little bit more, but yeah, there's no issue with this at all. Look at that. Uh, back to Dave of the past. Uh, so it's probably all that remains for me is to, just to say thank you very much for watching the review. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's helped you if you're considering a purchase like this. Uh, and if so, please consider supporting the channel. You can do that by subscribing. Uh, ring the bell if you want to be notified of new content. I'm not exactly prolific with my content, I will warn you. I am a bit of a fair weather rider these days, but uh, through the summer, I will be uh, posting various videos and I will eventually finish my uh, tour videos from last year's trip to Spain. And, uh, you could also give the video a thumbs up. Uh, I've put uh, some Amazon links below if you're planning to buy anything at all on Amazon. If you go through that link first, the channel earns a small commission, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. It's just a nice way for people to support the channel. Now, we do rather well out of Amazon links actually on, on the other channel. And I really appreciate that makes a big difference to small youtubers like me keeps us going anyway i'm gonna have to go and enjoy this sunshine i'm gonna head on the road towards shaftesbury and uh, see what there is to see there's some lovely villages around there so if you're ever in this part of the world some good riding down here lots of lovely things to look at i'm gonna go and do some of that thank you for joining me and i'll see you again next time cg rides